the global consortium uniting the world through education. All right, Bernice has yet again given me the finger back there, so we're ready to go. All right, I want to uh, say good afternoon to everybody here. And uh, Wabansi, uh, I want to say hello to you uh, for the little presentation that we have here today and just say a couple of words before we get into our guest speaker, Tom Nazario. Um, I think it's very important, and I want to take the moment to talk about global education and just about some of the shows that we've done in the past and some of the shows that we brought to Cerritos College and uh, linked up to the rest of the world today. We were connected to Jerusalem to talk a little bit about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which I think is important. And for the last couple of weeks, we've had shows on India, modern India, uh, with Dr. Namala. Uh, we had IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, that came to talk about what was going on in uh, Gaza and uh, the fight that they had with Hamas and uh, Hezbollah. And uh, after that, we had Colonel Ann Wright that was in the uh, military for 29 years and then had protested the war in Iraq as being an illegal war and some of the things that were going on in Afghanistan. And uh, of course, we're talking about other conflicts around the world. So I think it's important that we stop and kind of reflect what kind of education we're getting at the community college that we're bringing people from all over the world uh, for these particular shows. And again, I have pride in the idea that uh, I can get these guests and, and bring them in here and they travel great distances to, to come here. So I, I want to start off doing that. I also will tell you, uh, Tom, and introduce you in one second that what often happens in classes is that people have other classes that they have to go to and so you start seeing people occasionally drift and uh, I know as a teacher, I really hate it when students leave my class early. I take it personally and get upset. So I don't want you to take it personally uh, that people have jobs and they have other places that they have to go. Um, but uh, this is really what the global education is all about. And again, the idea of having ideas and concepts and theories and taking education really to the streets is what this global education is all about. So I'm very thrilled uh, that we have Tom Nazario here today. Now, I want to tell you guys just a little bit about the format uh, of my programs. I see some faces that I don't know. I see some other people that are in my class that I haven't seen in a while. It's nice to see you again. And uh, <laughs> I thought I dropped you, but anyway, you're still here. Anyway, so we have that going on. But the general format that I like to do is I have a couple leading questions that I'd like to ask Tom today so that he can share this with you. And the, the program is really supposed to be interactive. All right, I know about Tom. Uh, my sister is very well acquainted uh, with Tom uh, in, in the legal profession and they, they knew each other a long time ago and my sister said, you really got to get Tom on your show and I want to do that stuff. So I asked a couple leading questions and we get a little conversation going, but at that point I'd like to give it up to you and defer to you to be able to, you know, talk to Tom and ask Tom questions. Tom is an incredibly busy individual and uh, he's been to Santa Monica. I believe you said he had two meetings after this and then he has to fly to Arizona, I believe, tomorrow. I mean, just busy, busy, busy. And so I really appreciate uh, people that take the time out to come to Cerritos College and, and share this. And uh, oh, incidentally, Tom, you turned off your cell phone, right? Did. You did, I, I didn't, and I should, because the last time I did a show, I spoke about my wife, and she was watching the show, and she heard me talking about her, and she called me up on the phone and said, you're saying bad things about me, and you're on TV which I was, so I just better shut that thing off there before she can hear me. All right, you guys give a, a round of applause to our guests. We'll kick it off here. Uh, I just spoke to Tom. He has uh, some lengthy bios and some shorter ones, and I mentioned that if I read the long bio that I would do much of his work here today. And I don't want to step on his toes. I want Tom to be able to share some of his stories with you, a lot of different stories that I was fascinated with. So I will read you the brief bio here. All right, Tom Nazario is an attorney and a professor of law at the University of San Francisco School of Law. His interests lie in the fields of community, civic education, children's rights, family law, civil rights litigation, education policy, economic justice, and human rights, particularly as they relate to women and children worldwide. Professor Nazario has authored four books on children's rights, including the nat nationally acclaimed In Defense of Children, 
these publications have made him a recognized expert on the legal rights and the problems of children in America. In 1999, Professor Nazario was asked to travel to Dharamsala, India to meet with His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. He did so as a member of the legal team charged with preparing a report to be presented to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Child Documenting Human Rights Abuses levied by the Chinese government against Tibetan children, as well as the life experiences of nearly 2,000 Tibetan children who each year cross the Himalayas to escape Tibet slash China. The report entitled A Generation in Peril, The Lives of Tibetan Children Under Chinese Rule was presented to the United Nations on June 6, 2005. So that will be the, the brief bio and I'll let uh, Professor Nazario go out there and fill in some of the details for everybody here today, okay? Does that sound okay? I also wanted you to, as I said a little bit earlier, to take your stories where, wherever you want to take the, you know, the, the stories. This is your show and you get the opportunity to broadcast. I'm just going to read something from a, an article and uh, then I'll let you take over the show and I'll sit back and relax here today and listen to you. All right, it says here in this article, when I was a kid in New York City, we used to go to Howard Johnson's at Times Square for Thanksgiving dinner, says University San Francisco law professor Tom Nazario. Okay? One time on the way to dinner, I saw a woman and a little child picking through a garbage can. That was the first time I knew something was wrong. I mean, my family was poor, but this was something else. I guess it was that woman and child, along with the civil rights movement and my faith in children, that pointed me in the direction of service. So I thought I would just turn it over. I thought that'd be a great place for departure. Uh, that moved me, and I thought maybe you'd share, you know, where you went from there. Well, I did spend an awful lot of time in Spanish Harlem in New York. That's where I was born. Uh, that's where I played in the streets. That's where I got my first little cluster of friends. And uh, my mother is Cuban, my dad's Puerto Rican. And this was a long time ago. I was born in 1949, so long, long before you guys were up and about. And uh, I was only four years old that day when I saw this woman and her child going through garbage. Now, what struck me, I, I had seen kind of things like that before in Spanish Harlem, even in those days, but it was Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving means you don't eat out of the garbage can. At least that's what I thought. Uh, so even though I was only four, it struck me that there had to be something wrong in America to allow this to happen. By the way, even though, yeah, one of the things that was going on when I was little is that everybody around us was relatively poor. There were no rich people in, in Spanish Harlem. But I never realized that until I got a little older. I figured the whole world was really made up of people that were pretty much economically the same. That everybody had not much at all. And it wasn't until later in life that I began to discover that some people had an awful lot and some people had almost nothing. And so this giant chasm that exists between the rich and the poor, not only in the United States but around the world, began to, to kind of come to mind when I was young. So that day was kind of the first little whisper of that. Later on, however, in life I discovered more. Uh, and that's always troubled me. By the way, when I wrote this book called In Defense of Children, it's really all about kids in the United States. And just so you know, about a little less than four million children are born in the United States each year. But even though that sounds like a big number, that's less than 3% of all the children that are born in the world. And so when I started thinking about, well, okay, I'm pretty good with, you know, what's going on in the lives of children in the United States, but that's only a very, very small piece of the pie. So it began to make some sense to me that even though I spent most of my life working on domestic issues, to begin to work on international issues. And uh, so that, that was kind of a big awakening in my life. And one of the things that I think will happen to all of you, and it may not happen tomorrow, but it will happen, someday, somewhere, something is going to hit you and it's gonna drive you in one direction or another. And uh, the truth is that your life can change on a dime. And you know, when you get as old as I am and you look back at your life, you can actually pick out all of the points in your life that something happened that day that really changed your direction. 
that changed your focus, that changed your work, that changed your heart. And you know, when I was four and saw that, that again, mother and child, that was the first time that actually began to affect my thinking in life. I remember uh, teaching the history class and as a little kid, uh, and I have to say you look pretty good for 1949 there. I'm uh, starting to feel a little jealous there, but uh, anyway. I remember as a very small kid when the Vietnam War was going on, I was watching LBJ, and LBJ said that there was poverty in America. And I remember as a child lashing out, and I had plenty, I was middle class, yeah. well, middle, not high middle class, but at that point said, that's a big lie. There is nobody in America that is hungry. I, I, I really, I really believe that. I just, I can't believe LBJ is coming on there and, and saying that, it, it really hit me there. Yeah. You know, poverty in, in America, we're always talking about other places, but the, the poverty was, was here too. You, you talk a little bit about the, the civil rights movement uh, that kind of coupled with this. Uh, how did that play into uh, what you wanted to do in the world? Well, that began to unfold, of course, with the Vietnam War. Uh, and of course the civil rights movement in the South. Uh, when I was in college, I got this little job and the job was I was supposed to write articles on what was going on in America. And so, uh, and it was basically for the school newspaper. And so each summer they would send us out to various places to write and capture what was going on. And one summer they sent me out uh, to uh, basically the South to cover what was going on with all of the marches and everything else. And I was swept away with all of the emotion, uh, all of the tears that I saw, all of the lives, again, often in poverty, uh, the children, and the various kinds of discrimination, and it didn't take long to get wrapped up in the civil rights movement. And of course, the Vietnam War was something else, uh, the in injustice associated with that war. I began to do some of the things that you've heard about. I mean, take over administration buildings, had the long hair, the whole thing. <laughs> so uh, it, was, uh, it was easy to get swept away in those days. Uh, the late 60s was an incredible time. Yeah, we were talking about the LBJ. We saw a nice film on LBJ, and I said I have incredible empathy, maybe as a historian, we were talking about the fact that LBJ was looking at history and looking at the mm -hmm. historical lessons of World War II, and you don't reward an aggressor, and what would it be like to, to lose as an American president, the first president to lose, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and the great society. And I think that was so ironic mm -hmm. and uh, that LBJ didn't care about that. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was the, it was the great society that he wanted to do and it came back and that's what we remember LBJ for, Vietnam. Yeah. Very few people are talking about his work in the, in the great society, but right. uh, so. All right, I wanted to ask, we were talking a little bit about grassroots movement and uh, when you started to talk about, well, when you talk about the, uh, the street law program. Uh, we were talking about taking theory and different ideas, and uh, I, I really was fascinated with that. What, what happened to the, the kids on the street? How did that all work? You know, I was, I grew up in the streets, uh, and uh, I got a little bit involved in gangs, but most of the time I was just getting beat up rather than anything else. I was kind of a weakling. Uh, not much about me. So uh, I knew how easy it really was to get off on the wrong track and to begin to go down that track for years and not be able to turn it around. So when I became a lawyer, and by the way, I went to college in New York and then I went to NYU for graduate school and then I came out to California to go to law school. Uh, all of that really wouldn't happen but for the fact that I and this is kind of a cute story. I fell in love with this girl, and she didn't love me. And in fact, she probably wasn't allowed to even be with me. I know that girl. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, uh, I would work hard every day to save up enough money to buy a car just so I could drive her to school. She was Jewish, I was Puerto Rican. That <laughs> speaks a lot. She, uh, she liked me though, in a like kind of way. And uh, after three years of driving her to school every day at high school, she asked me, hey Tom, what college are you going to? And if you're Puerto Rican in New York, you really don't think about college too much. You think about maybe the Vietnam War, maybe going off to the war, maybe working at the Safeway or something like that in New York. But she asked me what college I was going to and of course, I hadn't really thought about it until she asked me. 
but I needed to impress her because I loved her from afar. <laughs> and so I, I had heard about this school called Cornell. And so I said, I'm going to Cornell. I knew Cornell was in New York, but I hadn't applied and frankly, probably couldn't get in. Uh, so I, I went around and I knocked on the door of an agency called Espita, works with uh, Puerto Rican kids, and they got me into college. But, but for the fact that she asked me that question, I never would have gone to college. It was all about impressing her. She knew she was going to college when she was in the womb because everybody in her family went to college and that wasn't really what was going on in my family or with my friends. I probably had 75 friends those days. I think three went to college, I was one of them. I went to college because of Janet Bloomstein. So again, that's, that's an example of how your life can turn around in a matter of seconds. Any given day, that, that can happen. So I went off to college and went off to graduate school and decided to become a lawyer again, largely because of the civil rights movement, and became a public defender. And I would, and I expect you guys know what public defenders do. I did that for two years. I got involved in a case where uh, a man had been uh, charged with uh, three counts of rape, uh, three different women, but the three, the, the same kind of MO. Uh, and uh, after working on that case for six months, I got him 12 years in prison. He could have gotten 25. I got him 12 years and I said, you know, there's gotta be a better way to spend six months. Plus, I knew he had done it and I felt, you know, if I'm gonna do any kind of good work, I should work with young people and I should try to maybe encourage them not to end up in the criminal justice system rather than doing it after the fact and working with people who are in. So at that point, I started working on setting up programs for kids. And, and the program you mentioned with the street law project, uh, I basically convinced my law school to give law school units credit to law students to go out and teach kids out in the public schools about law. So we send about 40 law students out into the field every semester and they teach a class on practical aspects of law for kids that are in high school and to some, to some extent kids that are in juvenile detention centers and, and in community centers. And so we try to teach them a little bit about preventative law, what to do if you get arrested, what to do if you buy a product that doesn't work, what if you're pregnant, what are your rights? So they, they really involve a lot of children's rights, but we do it in a preventative kind of way and it's very educational and so far 75,000 kids have gone through that program. Uh, in the Bay Area, and they all get diplomas at the end. And you know, the magic about that program is not so much the information that we bring the kids, the magic is that we pair up relatively young adults in law school with kids that are looking for good role models. And so they get the idea that they should go to college, that they might become lawyers, and that's what makes a big difference. Was that a tough sell at the, the law school? At, in the beginning, it sounds to me like it would be, I don't know. You know, it wasn't that tough of a, of a sell. That, that program has now been going on for about 33 years. And so the law school decided to do that long about the time it decided to do more in the community and this made a lot of sense. Yeah, you know, having gone to a graduate school, it's one of the things we were talking about before. You get all this information, you're sequestered in some kind of a cell, you're reading books all day long for graduate school and it's a wonderful thing to get your doctorate and you're out there and then you say, I'd really like to apply this now mm -hmm. and you're realizing you've learned all this theory but it's not really placed at the, the grassroots and we were talking about this a little earlier with conflict resolution with Jerusalem and Afghanistan and Pakistan. You kind of look at the, the students as they get their careers and move on to four-year institutions, many of them, and they get their degrees. How are you gonna apply what you learn at school? Yeah. I think it's great to get down to the grassroots and say, we got you, you're interested in conflict resolution? Well, let's go to a place that they have a lot of conflict and let's learn from their expertise and give people that, that job training so that when they're done, they get that experience. I think it's a, a fantastic program. I think it works two ways that you have lawyers yeah putting them in, in very difficult situations and maybe stretching them that they're not used to be in those situations. But I think also reaching out uh, to, to the kids that have somebody that they can look up to and, and their trials and their tribulations and, yeah. and, and ask questions and, yeah. and get that particular support. Yeah, it's a win-win program. The law students love doing it. They love getting out and working with young people and, uh, and becoming positive role models. 
you know, our law students have said, you know, this is a lot of work, we probably should get more units for doing this. But one law student said, but you know, it's kind of like having a baby. It's a lot of work, it hurts, but you get something out of it. And, and you do, anytime you work in the community, anytime you work with young people, it's, it's worth your time. Yeah, I wanted to ask you here, because there's a lot of stories I read about you that, that kind of move me and tell me what it means, but your friend Marty Jenkins, if, uh, what, what that story is, is all about, that, that was really touching to me. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of good friends, and Marty's one of them. Marty actually uh, was originally one of my students when I first started teaching. Uh, he, uh, African-American young man, he actually uh, played uh, professional football before he came to law school. He played for two years and then he decided he didn't want to get his body beat up and be forgotten somewhere and he decided he better get some sort of career so he came to law school and became a lawyer. And shortly after he graduated, he got this fancy job at uh, Pacific Telesis, uh, telephone company, and uh, made a lot of money there. And, but he wasn't really happy. I went and had lunch with him and he had this little plaque on the wall and he said to me, you know, Tom, I could work here for the next 10 years and at the end of my life, all that would be written on my tombstone is that I saved Pacific Telesis some money. And that didn't really mean an awful lot to me. And then he said to me, but Tom, you know, someday I'm gonna make you proud. And I said, you know, you probably already have made me proud. Lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, he becomes a judge. He gets appointed uh, a judgeship. And, and it's a municipal court judge, which is a low court judge. And then all of a sudden, he gets turned around, he gets appointed to the superior court. And I go to uh, his investiture, that's what it's called. And I shake his hand, I said, now, nah, you're doing really well, Marty. And then a couple of years later, he gets appointed by the president to the federal bench. Uh, and this is a lifetime appointment. And uh, I just couldn't believe one of my students would get on the federal bench that quickly. And so a couple of days go by, a couple of weeks go by, he gives me a phone call and he says, hey, hey Tom, you wanna come out with me? I'm gonna go uh, visit some people who need a little help. So I run over to his house, he lives in Oakland, California, and we go out and we visit this encampment of homeless people. And he says every Sunday or so after church he does this. And I never knew this about him. And he, and he brings um, uh, cereal, he brings uh, toiletries, he brings uh, blankets, and he just sits with the homeless. This is a guy who's on the federal bench, appointed by the president, sits with the homeless and he talks to them, and, uh, and he gives them whatever they might need. And so he, he walks up to this one fellow, and I'm with him that day, and, and, and uh, you know, the guy was in a bad mood. And he just wasn't really nice to Marty. And Marty finally says, well, isn't there anything that you need that I can help you with? And the guy says, what size shoes do you have? Because the guy really wanted a pair of shoes. And Marty says, what size are you? And he says, I take an eight. And then Marty says, well, will a nine do? And he takes off his shoes and he gives him his shoes. And that's the day, that's the day that it hit me how proud I was of Marty. All the other things that he had done, yeah, they were good, but that was exceptional. That was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah I think that says a lot about you and as well as Marty, very interesting. Can you talk to us just a little bit to, about your, your dream, the dream, Inge, what that, that's all about, what your, what your vision and... Well, you know, some years ago I decided I wanted to put together a foundation that would help kids reach their dreams, whatever their dreams might be. Uh, since then I'm now on a foundation board and that's one of the things we do. We fund kids uh, for whatever reason, they've kind of fallen through the cracks. They may have dropped out of school, they may have gotten in trouble with the law, but they have these dreams, but they just need some help to get from where they are to where they wanna be. And so we often provide the funding to make that possible. We have to, of course, have some assurance that they can make it, and they've gotta live up to some guidelines that we give them, but we, uh, we work with their parents, we work with their schools, we work with uh, probation officers, we work with whoever it takes to build an environment around them 
that will get them to the next step. And so... Um, Can you give us any examples of success stories, people that uh, you've backed there? And well, I'll tell you another story, yeah. It's, uh, we funded a program to help kids get to the next step, but it was, it was the result of really, it started with the street law program. We sent a law student out to a school called Castlemont High School in Oakland, California. And the law student uh, asked the kids in the class, where would you like to go on a field trip? And believe it or not, the kids said, could you take us to one of those big fancy law firms? And I didn't think that was a big deal. I mean, I go to law firms all the time, no big deal. But these kids had never gone to a fancy law firm. They've seen them on TV. So we took them to this firm, the biggest law firm in Oakland, California, and they went up this elevator to the 28th floor, and all of these kids at Castlemont High School ran out of the elevator, and the first thing they did was they went to the windows. They had never seen the whole of Oakland from the 28th floor. They had never even gotten out of their communities. They had never come to San Francisco, and they lived right across the bay. So it turns out that the kid who wanted to go to this law firm was shot and killed the night before the trip took place. He was killed for simply being there. He was just outside in front of his mother's home. Somebody came by, shot him, and he died in his mother's arms. The next day, this trip that he helped put together takes place. I actually go on the trip because I wanted to see the kids, and I'm told that the kid who helped put this together was killed the night before. So with that, it hit me that you know so many kids in inner city Oakland would love to do stuff like this. What I'm gonna do is ask the parents if I can use his name and the fact that he wanted to do this as some sort of avenue to raise money to do this long term. So over the next year, we raised a half a million dollars to put together a program at UC Berkeley where now kids for the last 14 years have been coming from the Oakland inner city schools. They go to UC Berkeley in the, uh, you know, the entire summer. We match them up with mentors. We get them on field trips. We pay them for coming to school. They take four courses at UC Berkeley. They get a tour of the campus. They get instruction on how to go to college. Many of them actually do apply and get into UC Berkeley. And uh, it's all because this kid who wanted to go to the next step of his life, maybe become a lawyer, never got to go that we put that pro program together. And you know, the Dreams Project funds it now. So again, it's something that may happen somewhere in your life as well, and it gets you thinking, and all of a sudden, you can build a project around it. There's always a, a way to make the world better. I had a guest on my show who just recently passed about a year ago, and the Port Chicago incident where the African Americans had blown up with the munitions in uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, this gentleman, one of my colleagues here, Jackie Troop, uh, very tight with him, and he came and I said, oh, what a, what a wonderful story. We're talking about Thurgood Marshall and the protection of uh, these African Americans. And uh, so I said, I've got to bring this, this guy on here. And it was one of the most moving stories I'd ever heard he was blinded with the explosion when he was 20 years of age. Yeah. And uh, so he was coming, obviously close to 80, I think, by the time he came here. Yeah. And he said that he had been married for 50 years and had never seen his wife before. Yeah. All right, I mean, students, I mean, did you catch that? He'd been married for 50 years, but he had never seen his wife. And he was talking and someone asked him in the class, he said, uh, are you angry? Uh, by the fact that I try to put in con you're 20 you got your whole life ahead of you. Yeah, you're 20 years of age You're, you're blinded, you know, you, you get married out there and he, and he wasn't angry And what I actually had him come to do was to talk about history not really What happened at the Port Chicago incident? You know what what happened with African-Americans? What was the case like mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden he went on a little tirade and he looked at all my students and said you know what he said where I lived he said you could go and you could take the, the train anywhere in the city for eight cents, anywhere you wanted to go all day long. Yeah. He said, the trouble is we didn't have eight cents. Yeah. All right, and he was explaining <laughs> that to try to bring the students in. And then he said to the students out there, you students, you can do anything that you want. Stop asking for handouts. 
Stop asking for people to give you things out there. The world's your oyster. You know, go out there and earn it. And of course, that's not what I invited him to do. But I thought, well, that's a good lesson anyway. I'll just let yeah. him keep on, you know, talking about that. You know, it's funny. It's like your your parent. If, if you talk to your kids, they don't listen to you. If somebody yeah. else tells the kids, and they then they listen. Yeah. You know, I used to go to somebody else's house and clean up their yard for them. My old man said, what what the, what the hell are you doing cleaning up someone else's? Well, it's not our house. It's somebody else's house. It's fun then. Right, you go out there and do that. So I wanted to ask you here, and I don't want to forget our guests at Wabansi, and we're getting kind of close. I want to ask you about your global work. I want to ask you about the Dalai Lama and all that. But from your, from your past, we talked a little bit about Spanish Harlem. Uh, we talked a little bit about you going to Cornell. All right, we <laughs> talked about the, the young lady and, and all that. But what kind of lessons uh, might you share about your own life and, and what you have achieved and uh, for, for, for the students that are here today? Well, let me just say two things. One is I don't, I don't want to suggest that it's going to be easy for you to, in fact, fulfill the dreams that you may have in your life. The truth is that it's much easier for some people to get to where they want to go than others. Um, I told that story about this young man in Oakland who never got to go on that field trip to my son. At the same time, my son was applying to Stanford. My son grew up in a fairly wealthy neighborhood. He went to the best schools possible, private schools. Uh, and he wrote an essay when he was applying to Stanford that addressed the question he never got to go. And my son talks about why this young man was shot and killed for really doing nothing more than being there while his parents had dreams for him, while his parents wanted him to go to college, while, him, while his parents had all sorts of uh, dreams in terms of their child's expectations. Yet that child never got to finish high school, never got to go to a senior prom, and of course never got to go to college. Why then does my son get to apply to Stanford? And the truth is, because the, the truth is that if you grow up wealthy in America and if you have connections, things come easier. They do. So I don't want to suggest that, you know, life is going to be easy. The other thing that comes into play is even though I grew up to some extent in poverty, um, I just decided that that was not going to be my life. That uh, I was going to set a path for myself. I would, one of the things I wanted when I was a kid, believe it or not, is I wanted to give my kids a backyard. I had seen backyards on television. There was this old show called Leave it a Beaver. <laughs> and, and they had this, this suburban kind of place that I had never seen before. This, you know, Spanish heart. I, I didn't even have a tree, much less a backyard. So I knew that if I was going to get my kids to the suburbs, I would have to do something with my career. So you have to really think early on where you want to be in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years and you have to build some steps to get there. So um, part of it too is frankly luck. Uh, I, I've been blessed. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is some of my international work. Uh, when I wrote In Defense of Children, it was even before the book came out, Oprah Winfrey had me on television. Once Oprah had me on television, I did three shows for her the book was all over the place. This was some time ago. And then I got calls from the United Nations. I got calls from Human Rights Watch. And I got put on committees uh, that traveled around the world. And sometimes just one thing leads to another. I did a talk uh, the other day, and I didn't know who was in the audience. But um, Steve Jobs' wife was in the audience. Now everybody knows who Steve Jobs is. Uh, and now she and I are working together on, uh, on building some new projects and doing some international work. So I would have never met the Jobs but for the, the fact that I just happened to be there that day talking about these kinds of things. So, you know, part of it is luck, part of it is hard work. And if you end up okay at the end of your life, you know, you've been blessed. You've been blessed. I asked Oprah if I could be on her show. 
She said no. Uh, so, <laughs> but anyway, if you get any little tidbits, you, you know, throw them my way. You know, something along that line. So I think that's very, that's very, very interesting. Uh, you know, material. Why not just a little bit? Uh, that way, everybody will have the full-fledged kind of feeling. C can you talk a little bit about your work at going into India and uh, the Dalai Lama and, and what you do there? My sister, I have to say this as an aside, I, I hope she's not watching the show. She's my, my younger sister, my baby sister, who makes four times as much money as I do. <laughs> um, I'm trying to make the world safe for democracy. They don't pay any money for that. Anyway, she's making all this money. And she, she calls me on the phone. She says, the Dalai Lama is working in a soup kitchen in San Francisco. If you hurry up, we can get down there. We can work with him. And I said, are you kidding me here? I'm going to roll up my sleeves and do that. And then she calls up, well, no, not really. This is not happening here. And I, I think she, on several occasions, she told me that I can go meet the you know, Dalai Lama. And we've had several shows. Um, one of my very good friends has just passed away, uh, Louisa Benson Craig. Uh, Miss Burma in the 1950s and a movie star and uh, deemed an enemy of the military junta. She just passed away a couple months ago out there. And uh, so we were very connected with a lot of Buddhist monasteries, yeah. a lot of shows. With, yeah. with, and uh, on the show in particular, we had um, some people in insane prison. Um, there was one, I'm just a little aside here to tell you where the Buddhist monks come in in the, in the monasteries. And this gentleman, was out here and a whole bunch of Burmese people were here for the show, but I didn't know who was going beyond my stage. So I said to the group out there, I said, the people that are speaking on my show, the Burmese people, would you please come up here? And it was a, a relatively young man in the corner right over there. And uh, two men had to pick him up because uh -huh. he was so badly beaten uh -huh. in insane prison. Yeah. And I was saying, there's my show. I mean, I had not anticipated that. He walked gingerly across here came up the stage and then he was standing where you are, two people had to lower him in, in the chair. I had another individual at the same time, he gave me at the end of the show a bunch of postcards, and very colorful you know, postcards and he handed them to me and I said, would you do me the favor and explain the postcards? What, what are the postcards? When he was in insane prison, he had a color marker, all right, like a chalk mm. and he chalked all the pictures while he was in insane prison, and when he left, he had the opportunity to photograph them. Hmm. And you imagine what you get when someone gives those to you. It's not just a, a picture, a photograph, or something. Where did it all come from? Yeah. Uh, some of these individuals, because their friends have been there 7, 14, 21 years, one gentleman said, well, I'm not like the other people. I've only been in insane prison for seven years, uh, yeah. and tortured, beaten, you know, all the stuff. So we've had a, a lot of uh, Buddhist monks that uh, have been in here, a lot of that stuff going on on, on Burma. So very interested in the, uh, the Dalai Lama and uh, what, what you do and why you were summoned and all that. You know, when people hear that I know the Dalai Lama, in fact, the truth of the matter is that he and I are very good friends. Uh, they always want at least one Dalai Lama story. So I, I, will, I will leave you with the Dalai Lama story before I finish up with you today. But j just to give you a little bit more background, um, I've actually traveled to about, uh, I'd say at last count, about 22 different countries. And in 1989, uh, this international treaty was signed. It's called the International Convention on the Rights of the Child. And because of my expertise in children's law, I was put on a, a team that traveled the world to actually investigate the treatment of children in various countries. And, and in one of those countries, actually the first stop along the long list of countries that I visited was Romania. And I was called to Romania many years ago uh, largely to um, spend time with children in orphanages there. These are children who were left in orphanages, uh, often by their parents, but sometimes by other care providers. Sometimes they were abandoned in the street and ended up in orphanages. But there were, at least when I arrived there, there were 67,000 children in orphanages. Now, um, I mean, I could, I, used, I have pictures of these children, and, and my job was to get a sense of how many kids were involved, and then try to do an assessment of how these kids were being treated by their government and how they were being adopted in other countries. The problem that we had at the time that I was doing this visit is Good Morning America ran a story on these children. And unlike children in Africa, who were of course black, these children were white. 
and hence there was a great attraction for people in the United States to run to Romania and get a child and bring a child home. So thousands of these children were being adopted illegally. They were being, papers were being forged, uh, and all sorts of money was being paid under the table to get these children, and that was really my first assignment for the UN and Human Rights Watch. There were many, many others, but that's the one that got me started. Uh, and if you had, did research on you know, Romanian adoptions, you would come up with these stories. This was some years ago. But then again, five, six years later, I was sent back to Romania, uh, to Bucharest, to believe it or not, count the number of children who lived in sewers in Bucharest. Uh, unlike unlike uh, in the United States or even in countries that are quite warm, children who are abandoned on the streets in, in Romania end up living in sewers because it gets cold in the winter and they have to go in there simply to survive. And so I would go into the sewers and count the children and the families and do reports on them. We, we did a report for 2020 and the news went out all over the world. And as a result of that report, uh, it took Romania three years more than it should have taken to become part of the European Union because the European Union said that we're not gonna have a country in, this, in the European Union that can't do better by its children. So, um, you know, and, and since then, you know, I've been to Thailand, I've been to Rwanda, I've been to Botswana, I've been to um, Nepal, of course, India. India is where I do most of my work. And the call that came in on, on uh, India really involved the Dalai Lama. Now, the very, very short story here is that uh, along about 1949, 1950, 1951, China marched into what was then Tibet and over the course of about the next 10 years essentially occupied that country and eventually uh, asked the Dalai Lama or pushed the Dalai Lama out. So the Dalai Lama had to escape his own motherland in 1959. Uh, and he's, been never, he's not been invited back since. And of course, the Chinese government and the Dalai Lama don't get along too well these days. Uh, so my, my, uh, what they asked me to do in, in that part of the world was uh, each year about 2,000 children cross the Himalayas to escape China slash Tibet to attend schools established by the Dalai Lama, which provide these children with a free education, free food, and, and warmth and clothing. Uh, but for these schools, these children probably wouldn't come, but they hear that there's an education there, and they are so impoverished in, in Tibet that their parents send them over the mountains, not knowing how tall those mountains are or how long a trip this is. It takes anywhere from 15 to 45 days for these children to walk across that mount, those mountains. And quite a few of them freeze to death on the way. And in fact, if you're crossing the Himalayas, and a lot of the kids cross the Himalayas in the winter because it's safer in terms of the Chinese guards. Uh, if you're crossing those mountains and the weather changes, you have two choices. You either keep moving or you die because you will freeze to death. And these kids have nothing but little sneakers and a little jacket and the hope that they're gonna make it. So I had to do a report on the treatment of these children in China. And in doing that report, I had to interview uh, about 100 of these kids. And we had, when we arrived, we had our guides there, we had translators, we had psychiatrists, and, uh, and we spent a lot of time with these kids. And over the course of writing that report, I spent a month with the Dalai Lama and he has been my friend since. And in fact, he does fundraisers for us. And I, that story you were telling about going to the soup kitchen, last time I was with, well, a couple of years ago, I was with Dalai Lama and I said, you know, your holiness. And, and the Dalai Lama actually likes people like us, Westerners, because we will actually talk to him in a straight manner. Why, why Tibetans really almost don't say anything at all because he's, He's a near God-like figure. So I said to His Holiness, I said, you know, when you come to the United States, you need to spend less time with Hollywood stars and rich people and more time with some of America's poor. 
And so next time you come, I'd like to take you to a soup kitchen and I'd like you to have lunch with some of our poor. And he said, let's go today. And I said, well, you know we can't go today because the State Department's not gonna let you go. Everything has to be checked out. They have to bring the dogs through to see and make sure there's no bombs there. It's gonna take a while to set this up, but next time you come, I'll take you. And he said, Tom, anytime you get an opportunity to do good, you should take advantage of it right away. Let's go today. <laughs> so he, he and I are starting to have an argument about whether I can take him, and I really can't. And so finally he agrees. He says, okay, next time I come, we'll go to a soup kitchen. And he loved that trip. He loved more than almost anything he's done in the United States. Spending time with some of America's poor was really where his heart is. I'll tell you one more story about the Dalai Lama. Uh, one of the first times I met him, uh, I was living actually in his home. And uh, he said, why don't you come in today and, uh, and spend some time with us because I'm going to be doing some audiences. And audiences are, you, you, anybody could actually email the Dalai Lama and if you have at least some reason to talk with him, regardless of whether you're rich or poor, in between, he, it, that, is, that doesn't matter. He will try and they will try to set up a, a meeting with him. And he, they often call these meetings audiences. So he he's invites people from all over the world to come and talk to him. And on this day, he had a very, very wealthy family from uh, Bombay, which is now Mumbai, uh, come up and see him in Dharamsala. He lives in the foothills of the, of the Himalayas at about 5,000 feet elevation. And um, this family comes in and I'm sitting there in the room and, and they talk to the Dalai Lama about all of the, all of the toughest questions of life, you know? What's the meaning of life? How can people be happy? Uh, could you explain Buddhism? Why do you meditate? Those kinds of questions. And at the end of this discussion, and they're both laughing and kicking around and acting like they're old friends. And the Dalai Lama is like that. He's, he's like a little boy in some ways. And at the end of the discussion, this gentleman says to His Holiness, says, could you do me one favor before I leave? And, and his Dalai Lama says, what? And, and he says, could you bless me and my family before we go? And I thought the Dalai Lama would say yes or no problem. And instead the Dalai Lama says, you know, I really don't like to bless people. For me to bless you would be kind of silly. After all, you're the same as, as I am and I'm the same as you. We're just two simple people trying to get through life the best way we know how. It would be ridiculous for me to bless you or your family. However, if you wish to feel blessed, go back to Bombay from which you came and work with all of those people in and around you who have so little and suffer so much, and in return, you'll feel blessed. And that's the kind of person he is. Humility, compassion. He's one of my best friends. I'm gonna write a letter to him now. I'm gonna, <laughs> Tom, you know me, I, right? I wanna say I know Tom. <laughs> yeah, because I asked him if I could meet him before too, and he said no. Uh, so, all right, would, would you be willing to take some questions sure. now? Yeah. Uh, I would just like to go, as we always do, defer to our guests out there, is, is will Bonsi, can, can they hear us? Can we see them? Do they have questions that they would like to ask Tom today? I see Congress on TV <laughs> doing nothing. Uh, <laughs> oh, Congress. All right, do we have any, uh, perhaps while we are going there, do, do we have any questions here at Cerritos College? We can fill in the gap for a little, little time. Again, let's take advantage. Tom's an incredibly busy individual running around, and do we have a hand somewhere up here? Yes, please, if you just say who you are. and. On, on that microphone, the green light should come on when you're on. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Diana. Um, when you talked about Romania, it kind of struck me because my parents are from Romania, and um, I've been to orphanage there, orphanages there before, and uh, I wanted to know when was the last time you were there? Well, I've made three trips, and I think the last time I was there was uh, probably 1997. 
So it's been a bit, it's been a while. And you know, the last time I was there, I was there to actually do a second count of children and families. And there, there are two things that I discovered. One is that there are fewer people living in, in sewers. But the other thing that I discovered is that uh, there is a second generation of families living in sewers. So individuals who grew up in sewers as children now live with their children in sewers. And, uh, and that was very depressing. Please. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also a woman, and uh, my whole family is um, the from there and more. But uh, and uh, yeah, so I was just you know wondering. In the, no, we just oh, got to meet. Gotta speak to each other after <laughs> class. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but I was just wondering if you um, have ever met in your work in, with the children in Romania. If you have met with the um, um, mission, like the Adventist Church or other, but Adra Romania or other relief agencies. There, yeah, I think we did long ago uh, when I was when I was there. You know, it's been over ten years now, and when we arrived, there were some people there who were kind of experts in the field, in this field of uh, of, of street children, and street families, and they took us to several places that, in fact, uh, work with this population and got us started. So I, I think I, I probably did meet some of those individuals. You've worked with them. Uh, no, but I was, uh, I actually support them because I'm also a uh, Seventh-day Adventist, so oh, yeah. um, I've been uh, struck by the problems that have been happening in there, you know, sometimes when I went to the Romanian church uh, in Loma Linda, yeah. I um, have this, they were having this, handing out this pamphlet about the, was these new um, orphanages that, uh, you know, they're making them, they're very high tech and uh, they're, uh, you know, nice heating and every everything so that the children that are less privileged, they can live better. So, uh... Well, just so you know, the reason why Romania got into this problem or had this problem is Cochescu, is that? Ceausescu. Ceausescu. Uh, he, he had this, uh, this great idea on how to make his country powerful. And so he came up with this edict and he said that all women between, of, of childbearing years, basically between 20 and 45, needed to have five children before they reached that age. Uh, and there were certain incentives and certain problems if they didn't. And so women started having these children, uh, and this was over two decades, and before long they had far more children that they can take care of because they were impoverished themselves and the state could not take care of them, so all of these children were basically abandoned in the streets. And the ones that didn't end up in, in the orphanages ended up in the sewers or ended up dead. Oh. Do we have Wabansi on the other end there? Okay, I just, I would like to defer to them if they're, if they're there, I wanna be polite. If, if they're not, then we'll take some other questions at, at Cerritos College, but Ellen, are you there? Apparently not. All right, why don't we keep it up there if they, they do come back on there, we're gonna have to, I said this, I know on numerous occasions, but let, let's take advantage of your all kinds of local stories and New York and Spanish Harlem and the Dalai Lama and around the world. <laughs> what other kind of stories we, and questions do we have for, uh, for Tom today, please. Uh, my name is Shao, uh, Sirius College. I was wondering if you really got to see that Jewish girl again. <laughs> You were? You know, Lat <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to answer all the questions if you don't feel like it. There's not a happy ending here. I mean, we, we uh, she went off to college in Connecticut, and the rumor is she met a doctor and married a doctor and has kids in Connecticut somewhere. But, you know, I would love to find her someday and thank her for asking that question. Uh, I don't, she has no idea what effect it had on me. Do you guys know the nickname of Connecticut? What the what stand for? It's the land of steady habits. Steady habits. I don't know if that says anything about your former <laughs> girlfriend, but anyway, that's that's Connecticut. The land of that's what they're famous for. The land of steady habits. Anyway, thought I would share that with you. All right. Other? Did you want to ask a follow, follow up question out there? And no. No. Yeah, I, I got a funny. While they're doing that, Tom, I don't know if you know this, but. My wife is British and I married her for a green card. 
Oh. And, uh, yeah, it's like a one-time deal, I thought. And it's like 22 years later, she's still with me. And I don't know what the, you know. The <laughs> I don't know. It's like these, these things can change your life out there. I don't know how it happened. But anyway, still hanging around, you know. All right, come on. Let's shake it up here a little, please. Yes. Um, my name is Selena. Mike, you mentioned in Romania about the children being adopted illegally. If there's that many children in need of homes, does it matter? Well, you know, that's a very good question. Uh, I think it does matter. There are certain kinds of protocols that I think really protect children's rights uh, and also the rights of the parents. In, in some situations, these children were simply, you know, they were dropped off in an orphanage, but the parents would return and visit uh, and never signed any papers saying that they wanted their children adopted permanently. And these are their children, and maybe they just needed some time off with the kids so they can get their lives together and come back for the children. Uh, and, and so you have to kind of cross all the T's and dot your I's before you give away someone's child. The other issue here is that it, it's really questionable whether or not it's in the best interest of a child to necessarily take them away from their culture, their extended family. Uh, it's a tough call. You know, we recently had a situation in Haiti where a group of kids were going to be kind of taken off to Dominican Republic and eventually sent off to new homes. Uh, I think uh, I think there's reason to slow that process down and make sure that we're adopting the right kids, and uh, and just again go through the appropriate protocols. Chris, okay, that's good. I, I just want to stimulate that as long as the questions keep going. I don't know if you guys know this that. I, I was on a, one of these shows that we ended at 3.30, and we got a little short, 10 or 15 minutes. I had to dance the last 15 minutes. So you want to avoid that. And, and tell <laughs> jokes, and talk about my wife, and all that stuff for the last 15 minutes. So yeah, please. Wait, let's start, please, you know, yeah, let's go here, and then we'll go up there. Yeah. I'm almost serious, though, as far as uh, you know, adopting children. I guess one of the biggest fears that I can see is obviously we have children being adopted without the proper paperwork and right. process. They might end up in uh, sex slave trade. Such, um, do you see that a lot as far as uh, having, you know, dealing with children and, and well, internationally? Yeah, well, I, you know, I certainly don't see it a lot, but one of my assignments was to go to Thailand and visit the brothels there and bring in police to do a variety of arrests there. And there's also a new law, and now it's an international law, which uh, will prosecute people who go off to countries specifically to have sex with children. And so I was in Thailand uh, doing some seminars for the Thai police on this new law and how to best enforce it. So the issues related to uh, uh, you know, child pornography and, and the prostitution of children and the exploitation of children is something that I'm quite aware of. We actually, through my foundation, we fund programs in that part of the world that try to save kids from being placed or put or sold into uh, the child sex market. So it's a terrible thing. Uh, you know, we've, dis we've gone into those brothels and found girls as young as 10 years old in those brothels. We, we interviewed a girl who was 14 years old and uh, had been working in the brothels for three years and what her night consisted of was ordinarily taking care of about eight to 10 gentlemen uh, for about $12 each. And of that $12, $5 went to the hotel, $5 went to the pimp, and $2 went to her. And of the $2 she got, she sent a dollar home to her mother. Uh, and this was her life. So uh, it's pretty horrendous stuff. And no one really knows how many often little girls are in the uh, child sex business. Uh, often, of course, it's never their fault. And the thing that often drives this, of course, is extreme poverty. 
Mm. Yesterday, uh, or a couple of days ago, I was listening to NBR and I was talking to my colleague here, Dr. Namal, we were talking about him and his brother's work with the untouchables. Yeah. And I was listening on NPR just to put it in perspective, but there was a, a gentleman who was a scavenger yeah. and they were talking about the rights and getting protections from the Indian government and he felt himself incredibly lucky because he was making three dollars a day and I'm not making fun, he was saying it, location, location, That's location right. in India as opposed to other people. So you start to put what kind of money we're talking, I think that's part of the, the story here. Somebody else had a, a hand up uh, here, yeah, Michael. Oh, just, just please, are you, are you close to a mic? I, there's there's no mic here, but I can talk loud enough. Okay, the trouble, Mike, I can hear you because you have that stentorian voice, but, <laughs> but other people can't because it, it's on the broad. If you just, why don't you lean into a, a microphone there or, or just push him away and uh, <laughs> I'm being facetious. That green light's on, like. Can you hear me now? Yes, Bernice says yes in the back. She's okay. the boss. All I, was, all I was wondering, we're talking about kids. What age is, in other words, when are they no longer considered a kid? And what's the youngest you've ever, you know, like 10 months, one year, two years, 15, 17, 18, where's the, is there any cutoff points? Well, according to international law, children are considered legally children if they're under the age of 18. And of course, that's also the rule in California. Uh, in some countries, however, uh, you can have sex with children above the age of 15. So there is some contradiction between international law and the law of sovereign countries. In Thailand, for example, uh, the line is drawn at 15. And one of the things that the girls will tell you right away is, well, I'm 16 or I'm 17. But often they're younger. Now, we have convinced Thailand to set their age at 18, and it looks like that's going to happen very soon. With regards to the youngest children, are you talking about the youngest children that I've seen sexually abused? No, that you work with. Oh, that I work with? Well, I, I mean, I work with children that are infants in terms of you know, either in the area of sexual abuse. Yeah, we've had cases with children that are that young, or of course children that are abused in other ways. Um, I do a lot of work for uh, counties or even law firms that are bringing lawsuits based on the sexual abuse or the physical abuse of children. So yeah, they can be quite young. Do we ever get Wabansi? Are they they're not there? They're not home. They're, they're connected, they're just <laughs> listening to, well, so we have Congress again. I just saw. I just wonder if anything's been been achieved in the last ten minutes. Anyway, all right. Other questions that we have here. You guys don't want to see me dance. It's a. <laughs> it's not pretty. Yes, please. Um, from Romania, right? Oh, well, yeah. Okay. And there are other things too. Like I know in some of these places, uh, I was hearing that um, peop some people that are in those uh, brothels or in other places where they're abused or they're um, um, forced uh, to work because of the um, difficulty that the parents are having. So the parents are literally sending the, off their children to, in the hard labor or into other things like that. Um, I have you ever encountered children who have this complex that they don't want to be rescued from that situation because they believe it's their duty. Um, I, I was um, hearing about that. Um, there, That is sometimes a problem. You know, you try to take them out of that situation and um, yeah. create a better place for them and they, they kind of don't want to because they believe it's their duty to help their parents in that way. Yeah, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. And, uh, you know, for some of these young people, they're making what they think is relatively good money. And uh, if we send them to school and they're not making any money at all and they're not sending any money home to their families, yeah, they begin to get second thoughts and sometimes they run out of school or escape from school just to go back into that environment. But, you know, often they learn quickly that that's a dead end road and that's it's gonna be a horrible kind of ending to their life.
Many of these children and young people, by the way, contract HIV as a result of their work. And uh, of course, that often means that they will die young or they will have children who will also have HIV. And, and now in Thailand, uh, but for a few countries in Africa, they're right up there in terms of the number of individuals in that, in that country, the percentage of adults who now have, who are now HIV positive. So it has a lot of other, there are a lot of other problems associated with, of course, the sex trade. Yeah. Hi, I'm Brianna from Cerritos here. Um, regarding the rights of guilt, the children in the United States, what do you feel the most pressing issues are now that we're going to be facing? Yeah, two. You know, if I were to, if I were to have a magic wand and and kind of do the best I could for children in the United States, one is I'd fix the educational system, and I'd make sure that not only do children get a quality education in this country, but there are really few distinctions between what rich kids get and what poor kids get in terms of education. The amount of money that your parents have shouldn't affect your health, shouldn't affect your education, shouldn't affect your safety or health and welfare. You know, it's okay if your parents are rich and you can get a fancy car, or maybe even live in a decent neighborhood, or a very nice neighborhood, or buy a big house. But some of the basics really should be given to all kids equally, regardless of where they happen to be born or who they happen to have for parents. The second thing that I would do is I would do something about child poverty. Children in America, uh, and they're 13% of, well, 13% of, of individuals in the United States live in poverty, and most of them are women and children. Uh, women who head family households, uh, and their children are the individuals in this country that are most likely to live in poverty. If you can lift the standard of living of those women and children, they would be far more likely to in fact get better health care, get better education, and live a safe and normal life. So I, I think those are the two things that if I could fix, I would. Okay, Michael. Um, dealing with uh, poverty with children overseas and internationally, I mean, there's a lot of different foundations out there that you know donate 13 cents a day and you can blah blah blah, right? Yeah. Um, how would you say their their efforts are coming? Well, you know things are getting better. Uh, in uh, in the year 2000, the United Nations put together something called a Millennium Report. And the Millennium Report now tracks the progress that we're making with regards to the health and welfare of children around the world. And we actually have been doing much better. We're not moving as fast as we could, but huge philanthropies, or philanthropists like the Gates Foundation, uh, other organizations, uh, they've actually made some inroads. So fewer children are now dying before their fifth birthday. Fewer uh, women are now dying as a result of uh, childbirth. More girls are being educated around the world. Uh, so there has been quite a bit of progress, probably not enough, but there has been, you know, this has been a movement to, to better the lives of children around the world. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, this was not even on the agenda. Uh, things were actually much worse. We have a long way to go, but things are getting better. Please. Now, can I ask you, I know this is a pain in the back, so I can hear you just fine, but because it goes through, if you grab a microphone, I'd really appreciate it. You were talking about depravity and... Hi, my name's Jeff. Um, you were talking about depravity with kids in the healthcare system. With the new healthcare bill getting passed by the House of Representatives and um, kids with like autism, Down syndrome, it's not in the bill to help out the families. How can you change that? By I know we could talk to our Congress, but how can you? Because you have high influence with the Dalai Lama presidents around the world. How can you change that to you help know, the I, families out? I, yeah, I think the jury is still out on the new health care bill and how it's going to be implemented and what it's going to do in terms of making a difference in the lives of many uh, children and, and their families. Uh, I think we probably won't have a real good measure on that for about another five years. 
And uh, hopefully at that point in time, somebody's gonna do a study and see what, what differences it has made, whether it can be improved by then, maybe most of the American public will get used to it mm -hmm. and begin to embrace it. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think that decent health care for everyone should be a human right. And in a rich country like America, we should be able to afford that. So hopefully, uh, hopefully things will get better and more people will be covered. And uh, I, I have to believe it can't get any worse. So it's got to get better. Tom, I wanted to ask you a question as a lawyer. We were talking about this the other day. Can the federal government mandate that everybody have health care? You find a lot of these attorney generals around, <laughs> uh, we're paying a close attention to that, say, yeah. and somebody who's making the distinction between getting car insurance and say, you don't have to, you don't drive a car. It's, it's a privilege to drive a car, so if you choose not to drive a car, you know, you don't need the, the insurance there. Yep. And we have a bunch of uh, attorney generals, plural, that are, are talking right. about suing. And those are, those are the exact arguments that are gonna be made to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's gonna have to decide that question. Can we legally enforce uh, this mandate on individuals? Does it violate their liberty rights to tell them that they have to have health insurance? Mm -hmm. Or uh, it, it is the fact that it, it betters our society, is it, it saves us money long term, uh, does that outweigh their rights? So we'll see what the Supreme Court says. Hopefully by then, maybe Obama will have a few more appointments. Well, my, my, my <laughs> own opinion on that is that I was in favor of health care reform. I also think the attorney generals have a very good case. Oh yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, can you, can you force somebody to go out and purchase something uh, against their, their will? Yeah and you think that the Obama team had done their homework in advance realizing that this was going to happen, but I've had many, many, I'm, I haven't been keeping up on that, 10 or 12 attorneys generals that, that I had heard were, were going to sue. That's mm -hmm. a very, very interesting part. Yeah, it's an on. interesting question. Yeah. All right, let's, 10 minutes, uh, Michael. A little off the subject, but you and Dr. Haas both seem to me to have a inner drive, okay? You're able to point when you went Michael, to tell me what that is, because I don't... The inner drive? My one, I, I know his one, I don't know, yeah, what okay. that one is. Go. Sit down, be still. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm just interested. In. You were able to pick the time or the point in your life when you wanted to go to college to impress the girl, but yet before that, you had to go to high school, and you had to go to grade school. Yeah. You had a drive. Where did it come from? Your mother, your dad, in inside you, where? Spanish Harlem. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it sounds kind of silly, but um, it does go back to Leave it a Beaver. Wanting to have a house with trees, wanting to live in a better neighborhood, wanting to have a better life for my kids. And I knew I wasn't gonna get there unless I robbed a bank or went to school. And, uh, and so at least going to high school made some sense to me. Uh, but the notion of going to college is something that I, I really had no experience with. I didn't know anyone in college, so that had to come to me through a different source. You know, the other question that that kind of raises is how come we have some people in the world that actually care enough to do something, whatever that might be, and other people in the world who really couldn't give a damn, who spend their lives in malls, who, uh, who never have done anything for a soul. Uh, what, what is the little thing that comes into place that makes that difference? Is it just something that happens on a given day that kind of spins your head around? Is it something you're born with? Some people are born nice and compassionate, other people are born rotten. Yeah, I, I don't know the answers to those questions, but um, I wish I did, because if I did, I'd make all of you world changers. Let me, let me tell you a little story about a student that I had once. Uh, and, and it may it may be kind of like many of you here. She actually didn't know what she was going to do with her life. Uh, she was in law school, last year of law school, one of my students, all of a sudden she doesn't show up for class. Three, three and a half weeks go by, she's not in class. I pick up a phone, I call her. And it so happens that my voice 
is just like her father's voice. <laughs> she picks up the phone and she starts crying. And I don't know why she's crying, but it turns out that her father had just died. And three weeks before, she left school to go uh, to where her father lived and, uh, and, of course, attend the funeral. And when she heard my voice, again, it sounded just like her dad, and that's why she broke down. So it turns out that she was going to graduate from law school, and her father was going to come out for the graduation. It also turns out that her father and her mother had split up. Her father not only lost the marriage that he had been in for a number of years, but also lost his job. And he was living in a little dive apartment, and all of a sudden, he decided to kill himself. So she goes back home after her father had committed suicide and um, goes to a, his apartment and on one side of his bed is a picture of her as a little girl. And on the other side of his bed is his plane ticket to her graduation. And when I heard that, I said, you know, I'm gonna come to your graduation. And I was there for her. And that day, she, she gave me a big hug and she said, I'm joining the Peace Corps because I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life, but I think I need some time to figure it out. She went off to Kenya, and when she got there, no one told her what her job was. And the Peace Corps left her there and said, you'll figure it out. And she did. She decided to buy herself a bicycle, and she traveled all around to the villages and around where she was, and she discovered that her job was to find every sick child she possibly could find and get that sick child a doctor before the child died. And in many cases, she was able to find a doctor before the child died. Because of course, in parts of Africa, what kills you is not the disease, but the distance between you and a doctor. And again, uh, she never knew that her life was gonna turn out that way, that her dad was gonna die, that she was gonna go off to the Peace Corps and she was gonna be saving children in Africa. You don't know how your life is gonna turn out either. But whatever you do, do something good. Okay, we have a couple more minutes and we'll take the full time here because I know there are people out there that are thinking, should I ask the question out here? I'm thinking about it. What would happen if I did? Just go ask the question. Hmm? Michael? Well, kind of unrelated to what we've been talking about, but you're a lawyer, you specialized in, uh, in children's law. Um, I see a lot of, with uh, my peers, because I'm a little older than a lot of these people. <laughs> uh, with my peers, they're having kids and stuff like that, and, and they notice with a lot of children uh, of their, the people they see, that their children are completely undisciplined. People are scared to discipline their kids because they feel like any discipline is abuse. From your point of view and from the law's point of view, what's the line between discipline and abuse? Well, you're probably asking the wrong guy. And the reason for that is that I actually wrote a law two years ago that would make it illegal in California for any parent to hit a child under the age of three. And there was such a fear about that. I mean, I ended up on the Today Show, the Good Morning America Show, all the, such a fear about that that it didn't get through Sacramento, though the governor said he would sign it because he's never hit any of his kids and they've turned out okay. But legally, where the line is drawn in California is, uh, if you use physical force on a child to discipline that child, and in doing so, you break the skin, or you use an instrumentality of some kind, like a spatula, or a, an appliance cord, something like that, or that you create a large welt, or you hit the child in the face with possibly a closed hand instead of an open hand, or if you hit the child in the face and the child is of a certain age, actually, they're kind of encouraging you not to hit a child in the face. Um, but that's kind of where the line is drawn. A welt, an instrumentality of some kind, 
a break in the skin, some kind of laceration, that's where you've crossed the line. So as long as you use an open hand on a child um, and, you, and the child is of the appropriate age and the child understands why he or she is being hit in that manner, you've probably not broken the law. Um, I just wanted to ask you in the, in the next couple of minutes, and I'll, I'll say the, the thank yous. Can you give us, uh, in part, any, any wisdom? And we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I have so many people that come on the show, and people really want to make a difference, and uh, they need some kind of a formula. Is there any advice you can give to the, the students here that they, they can move forward? There are a lot of good deed doers. They want to help out and anything that they can do. You know, I, I don't think there's any magic formula. I think what, if you're gonna do anything at all, first of all, check out yourself. You know, spend some time with yourself, figure out what your unique talents are. What you bring to the table, what you bring to the world. Figure out if there's something out there that touches you. What's your passion? And then have the courage to pursue it. The trick is, I think, courage and persistence. <clears throat> Don't get swallowed up by what everybody else is doing. Uh, don't spend your life consuming stuff and not giving anything. Uh, and most important, remain awake. Uh, you've got one life to live. Uh, don't give it to some company that's gonna give you a job that you hate. You know, a lot of people ask me, are there some keys to happiness? There are actually about 10, but that's a whole different other talk. <laughs> but, you know, one that's, one that's really is important is that a good part of your life is gonna be spent at a job somewhere. So don't take a job that you hate. And even if at some point you have to take a job that you don't like too much, then find something constructive to do that speaks to your passion on times, at times when you, when you have a little time. The other thing that I would recommend in terms of just how to lead a, a relatively happy and sane life is keep your life simple. Don't get buried under things that own you rather than you own them. Try to do some traveling and try to really learn from what you do. Make goals for yourself, and on any given day, try to make a little difference in some positive way. Um, as the Dalai Lama said, you'll feel blessed in return. Okay? Okay. Give a nice round of applause for our guests here. about two minutes here because I have to end on time because we're on TV so if you guys could just chill for, for two minutes. It's been a, a long day here today. Some of you people were at the Israeli-Palestinian uh, talk here and I just want to let you know that uh, I got an email about 625 I think this morning that Bernice who was in the back was trying to make contact with the Palestinians and finding out how to do the, the test and all that. And I just like to stop and reflect when we have these shows that there are people that make the show happen. So I think we should give a nice round of applause to Bernice Watson in the back. <laughs> this stuff can get incredibly stressful when you're trying to get everything organized. I don't know if Ellen and Wabansi can hear me. I'd like to say thank you if you're tuned in here and we'll touch base through, through email and things. Uh, I've seen different professors that were in here and I've seen the, the students that have come in, in here and I, I thank all of you, we're, we're trying to get this. Another thing that I'd like to talk to students about and I've asked you know, periodically is what you people think about global education. I think we start telling people on campus what kind of education that we're getting here, what kind of people are coming to Cerritos College, how we're reaching out to a, a lot of people. And so it'd be really nice to have that feedback. But I'd like to thank the students that have come here on numerous occasions. I have several students that set up microphones today and helped out and all that stuff. 
And uh, I want to thank 3C Media for allowing us to have two shows in, in one day. <laughs> and I think the, the last thing that I have to say is for my 275 class, because this is their class, that your next test is uh, next week, all right, on, on Wednesday, not on Monday. So I don't want anybody, I don't want anybody to do any work over the weekend. I don't want to do all that stuff, all right? Thank you very much. Thank you.